they then reevaluated their management pool against new criteria of leadership. The net result was chaos and confusion, and the ultimate rehiring of those whom they had fired. To summarize, organizations need to decide on a framework for their change efforts independent of the latest management fad or buzzword. They need to decide what they want their future state to be, what their present state is, and what methods they are willing to use. In addition, they need to decide on their measures of success, how much employee involvement they need, and the sequence of implementation. I wish you the best of luck in your journey in the wonderful future you wish to create. Someone once said, luck is where hard work meets opportunity. You have both. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chaudron. Uh, we are now going to continue with the second question and answer session. First question is coming from the University of Guadalajara in Guadalajara, Jalisco. We're calling from Guadalajara. My name is Alberto Gonzalez, and I'm with Motorola. What is the structure you recommend for us for the committee that implements reengineering? It really depends upon the amount of employee involvement that you really wish to have. Uh, in some organizations that do not really want to involve line employees, the executive steering committee is mostly limited to those very senior people in the organization. Uh, for those organizations wishing more employee involvement, um, people putting, putting lower level employees into the executive steering committee or at least having input into the executive steering committee is a wonderful way to show employee interest in terms of what, what is going on. From Atoyac Auditorium in Mexico, this is coming from the DF Federal District. Thank you. You who are experts in this, what would you tell the leaders, uh, union leaders and the and leaders of the enterprises so that they can implement re-engineering in their firms and companies? They must realize that re-engineering their corporations of which they're involved in is really in their best interests. They also must realize that if re-engineering is to be successful, there needs to be fundamental change in the relationships between the union leadership and management, and that it needs to become a more cooperative one in the enterprise, and what may be standard rules, standard policies and procedures in unions may need to change in the best interests of the employees that work for both of them. Paraguay, Catholic University, Asuncion. Yes, from the auditorium here. Is it possible to implement reengineering programs, TQM, in the commercial area without really um, making slow the relation between uh, the different uh, aspects of the process? It's really in one's own best interest to coordinate as much as possible beforehand uh, rather than after, after, after already actions of TQM or reengineering have taken place. Um, very often I've seen in organizations where there are so many buzzwords that are being implemented that the average line employee knows little or nothing about what to do. And this is a situation that I would strongly suggest that you avoid. Next question is coming from Sanyo, North America, Sanyo Company from Tijuana. And while we connect with them, I guess we can read one of the facts questions coming from Panama. What is the difference between BPR, between process and task? between process and task in business process reengineering and also in total quality management the process and the task are really part and parcel of the same thing the task if you want to define the differences between the two is what needs to be accomplished 
the process is that what makes that task happen. In TQM and in reengineering, it may be the task that may change, but for certain it is the process that must also be altered. From the Technological Institute in Chihuahua. Good morning. Will you please elaborate or give us your comment on what things Ford is doing properly and what is good about the fast implementation of reengineering? Thank you. They have had to change quickly. And because they have had to change quickly because of the increased competition, uh, again, from Japanese car manufacturers, they had to act fast. So they did. That is the good thing. They reacted according to what their environment told them they needed to do. Um, one thing that what has happened in the United States, for example, last year, is that the car companies have made uh, quite a bit of money, unfortunately, for them anyway, is the Japanese car companies, despite the increase in the value of the yen, have increased their market share as a result. Um, Ford has realized that they cannot stand on their laurels and that they must substantially improve what they do, even though they are reasonably successful right now. Another participant, this time coming from Tecate, Baja, California. Okay, now let's see if they connect again. Bad, bad sound. I can't hear a thing. Okay. I can't. This is bad. Can you hear us? They hung up. They hung up. Well, now we have another question via fax. This one's coming from Mexico again. What are the problems that you can face when you apply TQM and in editorial publishing houses? One of the fundamental questions that one has to ask oneself when you're dealing with publishing is, what output do you want to create and what do your customers need? Um, if you assume that they simply want paper output, you may need to not change your process at all. But with the changing aspects of publishing, getting into multimedia, CD-ROMs, uh, online databases and such, you may have to substantially change what products you produce. You first have to make that decision before you can substantially alter or modify the processes that you have to make those products. Another question from San Luis Potosí. How must, how must you apply TQM in enterprises that are um, involved in uh, raising animals? animals? In, in raising animals? Mm -hmm. That's an interesting question. I hadn't really thought about that before. Um, for certain, the raising of animals is a process. It is subject to a wide variation in terms of the food that you give them, the type of stock that you use, and also what kinds of animals your customers may be interested in, in buying or purchasing. One of the most interesting parts about it, though, is that particular process can be documented and that particular process can be improved. It would be a very interesting project to do that. It would be um, perhaps one of the most interesting questions is what your measure of success would be in that particular process. Dr. Wolf, did you go? Yes, the reason I'd like to speak to that subject is because I just came from a ranch this last week. My son runs a 50 uh, cattle ranch up in Atascadero. And I was just getting caught up in the cattle industry in the United States. <clears throat> While we have less cattle in the United States than we had, let's say, four or five years ago, the production of beef has gone up. And really, that's because there are continuous improvements even in this industry. The time it takes for a, from a calf to the time it's born till it reaches 500 pounds when it's sold to a, uh, to a, a feedlot has decreased remarkably. There are all kinds of opportunities for improvements, even in the animal growing industry. The pharmaceuticals that are coming along, the export industry is taking a large percentage of our beef. What do our customers want? Do they want fat in the beef or do they want lower fat content? So yes, everybody is, really can be involved in the TQM process. We are in a change a revolution in all of our industries. <clears throat> 
And now we are going to have a question coming from University from Tijuana, Baja California. This is Iberia American University. Sí, lo escuchamos. Adelante, Tijuana. No connection. Well, the person is not on the other line, on the other end of the line, and we would like to remind you that you must send your questions via fax or by phone. Please do not make them too long and don't ask two or three questions at the same time. Now, let's uh, take another question from the Ibero-American University in Tijuana. Speak. Good morning. My question is to implement re-engineering, is it indispensable to have education in a, on TQM and a good uh, working condition of TQM? TQM would provide a good foundation for a re-engineering process. You do not necessarily have to start TQM as the first step, though. You can go directly to business process re-engineering. It is going to be more of a leap. That certainly is possible. And if your time frame is very short, you simply just might need to be doing that. One of the issues you're going to have to decide is if you have already started a TQM program and you already have many teams working on incremental improvements, you may have to decide that many of those teams are not necessary because up as part of re-engineering, -re the processes that they are working on no longer serve a purpose to the company. We have another question. This time it comes from, from Mexico. Hello? 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 Uh oh. Well, we lost contact here. Please, dear participants. Once you have asked the question or once you have connected, please stay on the line so that we don't hang up and we don't lose contact. The next question comes from Zacatepec, Mexico, in Morelos. Muy bien. La, la pregunta, the question is as follows. What is the relation between the, the organizational development from Warren Bennis and BPR when you try to apply a change in an enterprise? I don't know about the, the right author. Yes, that's an interesting question. Warren Bennis's uh, work chiefly focuses in on individual, on the individual and an individual's leadership capability which is vital and critical um, for a business process re-engineering to take place. Business process re-engineering really has to do with more with changing tasks and systems and so really involves the entire organization. Um, the added benefit one would use by focusing on leadership is it focuses in on the management and motivation skills of especially senior management in the organization. Now we have another participation. Somebody else from Mexico is coming with a question from the Atoyac Auditorium in the Federal Commission of Electricity. I'm calling from Tulatepeji, Mexico. Are the organizational techniques such as BPR, TQM, and others are, have not been generated within the enterprises, and that, and it's usually created by a, an external consultant because there is not, not a link between the enterprises and the universities to be able to walk hand in hand. It's supposed to be a question. Uh, that very well might be. It's, it's difficult often to create the links that are necessary for, for business process reengineering to take place. One of the nice aspects of when companies do benchmarking or when they do business process re-engineering is that they come in contact with people who they normally haven't done so. And they can learn some wonderful new techniques and opportunities as a result of that kind of interaction. Um, it very well may be that many of these organizations have been operating, if you will, in the blind. 
and the business process re-engineering will begin to create the interconnections um, that will serve the long-term interests of both parties. It's kind of interesting uh, what has transpired in the United States on TQM and business process engineering. Four or five years ago, maybe a little bit longer than that, there were very few colleges that offered courses in TQM and these kinds of things. I can't think of any college, particularly at the university level in Southern California, that isn't offering courses in this way. Yes, companies can call upon uh, universities here to help them uh, in their activities. And we are stretching out now that we can actually go on site and help them conduct their training programs, actually train the trainer so they can uh, continue the process. And, and really speaking, what you're going through right now is an example of that, of that link. And we have another participant from Saltillo. Welcome. Good morning. Could you elaborate your explanation on the advantages and disadvantages of using a focus of incremental changes instead of a radical change focus or approach? The advantage to an incremental approach is that you don't get too many people upset when you implement it. Uh, if I'm only going to be making modest changes over a long period of time, uh, I may be able to smooth over any differences that might occur among the various constituencies and power groups in the organization. You also may have to use an incremental approach when you are severely constrained. You, it may be, at the moment, very difficult for you to change the compensation policies, performance appraisal policies, union rules and regulations at first in heavily regulated industries or in certain forms of government. At that point in time, an incremental change effort might very well be useful to start. More or less, what that will do, that will help loosen up the organization so it may eventually accept a more radical approach like business process reengineering. A, one more participant from Pemex, Petro Mexican Petroleum from Veracruz, Mexico. Good morning. The question is bad sound. How do you, re how do you implement reengineering in, in our company given that this uh, Mexican Petroleum company has very limited budgets that depend that in the budgets are determined by people who don't belong to this company? What it really boils down to is you have to work with, with what you have. Uh, you really must get away from the idea of that TQM or business process reengineering is some square that must be pounded into a round hole. You must decide what kind of budgets you have, and based upon the budgets and commitment to that, then you must take what you have and do what you can. And by showing your success in doing that, hopefully the next time and the next budget cycle, you'll be able to request more money so you can ultimately, ultimately be saving the larger enterprise even greater income. I would ask the question, what is limiting Pemex from obtaining more revenue? What are, are there any wasteful practices as far as pumping oil or refining oil? It is possible for a corporation to really pull yourselves up by the bootstraps, but you have to break away from this frame of thinking that just because of budget problems we can't do things. <clears throat> and now we are back to Mexico. The question would be how to apply BPR if the, because of the budget cuts we cannot implement the um, economic incentives to personnel, bonuses, etc. One of the, I'm sorry, one, one of the issues that what one has is how can we be affording profit sharing? The interesting portion about it is, is that if profit sharing or some kind of bonus plan actually can almost be self-paying in that the money that one puts out there actually is an incentive to workers to produce more. As a result of the cost savings that are produced, the profit sharing can actually pay for itself in the organization. 
However, what very well may be required is some initial upfront money, at least as far as planning is concerned, in order for that particular kind of effort to be successful. Um, you have to be also be very careful, though, that if the first thing that one does is wants to put in a profit sharing or bonus plan, you can very easily end up with providing motivation and incentives to people who do not have the tools to improve what they can do. As a result, it's like my asking you for, to lift a million pounds all by yourself and I will give you a million dollars. It basically would be impossible to do. But if I were to give you the tool of hydraulic lift, it would be very easy to accomplish and I could very easily uh, be giving you that million dollar bonus. I've worked with many companies that are downsizing at the same time that we're putting in programs like this. And yes, there are many people in our teams that ask the question, if I do these kinds of things, where is the denario? You know, um, what we're pointing out to people nowadays is that we're in a lifeboat on a stormy sea together. And that really, if we want to have job security, we're going to have to find ways of doing things. But it also has to be understood in the part of management that if we do make gains in the company, that it's going to be, they're going to participate. There's going to be some kind of a setup where everybody participates so everybody in the whole process can become a winner. It's a question of timing, but first of all, we have to make these incremental gains. It has to be seen in, in, uh, in dollars, and then eventually it's going to have to be passed off with some equitable way to all, who, uh, all, all pe people in the organization. One, one example of this is where one company basically agreed to say that for a particular scrap rate, that for all monies saved below the 1% scrap rate, the company would split 50-50 the profits <clears throat> between the workers and the company. That way is that the monies that are automatically created as profit can be shared. So there is no, if you will, upfront money that's required using that particular kind of profit sharing. Our next participant comes from Guanajuato. This is the electricity company in Guanajuato, Mexico. Within your presentation, you were saying that there are four ways, four options for change, one of which is to establish a pilot program before you actually implement the whole the process in the whole enterprise, the whole company. Could you describe some example of a project, pilot project that you have seen, that you have worked on? I, it sounds was bad, but that's the question. Okay. <clears throat> the, perhaps the best well-known example is, this, is the Saturn uh, car company in Tennessee. With the Saturn company, in essence, is that they basically went away from Detroit. They then established a company completely independent of the rest of GM operations and created an entirely new management union relationship and establish an entirely new way of working together. They also have put in profit sharing um, in addition to those other particular kind of management changes. As I said in my presentation though, that even though the Saturn car company is reasonably successful, at least by some measures, GM has been very slow to take on the lessons learned and applying it to the, to the larger corporation. It is a very difficult process. It, I should say it's a very easy process to basically have start a pilot project somewhere else. It's a much more difficult process to take those lessons learned and apply it to the larger enterprise. Gracias, doctor. Una pregunta más proviene de Paraguay, Asunción. Adelante. Coming from Paraguay. Good afternoon from the auditorium here in our university in markets that are completely new, such as Mercosur, how can we create quality parameters for re-engineering mm -hmm. of an enterprise when we still don't have information or prior experiences or models? That's indeed is a, is a, good, is a good question. It's important to realize that you may actually have to, if you will, fumble around for a while before you come up with good measures of success. What I would always say is, is that regardless on whether you have, if the, whether it's a new market or an old market, that you carefully find out who your customers are and what they're going to be needing now and in the future. And if you continuously keep in contact with those customers, incorporate their feedback and improve your product as a result, 
that particular measurement question will probably go away because that's in essence what you're doing. You're measuring your customer satisfaction with what you do. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, another question from Puerto Vallarta, from Jalisco University on the coast. I am the director of this uh, university center. What, how can you apply reengineering and TQM to a, an ed educational institution that is, has been newly formed? One of the very careful questions that one has to ask is that who are our customers to begin with? As an example, there is one particular university in the United States who has defined their customers not by geography, as is what is very often done, or by discipline, which is also very often done, but by just by geography of the entire United States. They provide electronic courses, and you can get a bachelor's and a master's degree by receiving their courses electronically, and they have uh, tutors that are set up, they have monitors that are set up for testing across the entire United States. So one has to ask oneself, who is our customers, and to bound what you want to achieve and not to achieve in your organization. Based on that, then you need to decide what particular kind of tasks you need to perform to accomplish that particular mission. After you decide those particular tasks, then you can start asking yourself the larger questions of what kind of support system one needs, what kind of compensation system one needs, what kind of organizational structure one needs. If you have a new organization, it really presents an opportunity to install these new concepts. It's far easier to do it than if you have an established organization. You don't oftentimes have to retrain people. Let's say that you took some people from Guadalajara and moved them out to uh, uh, the coast. They probably have ideas of the processes they're involved with, admissions, registrations, whatever it might be. Might be. By empowering them and asking them to take a look at what they've done in the past, and how can we do it better out here? You know, uh, there's all kinds of opportunities. It's much easier if you're starting a new company and a new site to really embrace these new ideas right from the very beginning. It's also important to realize that you must allow yourself to make mistakes. And it will be guaranteed that when you go through this process, you will be making mistakes, and it's okay to do so you probably will be making more mistakes in a new organization than you perhaps will in an old one. On the other hand, you have a greater chance of actually improving on what you do because things are not so fixed and concrete as what George was talking about. Now we have a call from Panama, from the University of Panama. Bad sound. The question is, if you invert the pyramid and we take management as the first thing, don't you think we will um, hurt the needs of the, the other workers in re-engineering? Re-engineering, or at least using that word, can be an excuse for a lot of layoffs. And that has been true in the past. One has to realize, and management has to realize, that the employees are just as easily a customer as the stockholders, or as the government, or as customers are. Given that perspective, the solution, or the re-engineered solution that it must come up with, must satisfy all of those customers. Ultimately speaking, the worker needs to be satisfied just as much as the external customer does. Thank you, Doctor. Now we have another question from the University from Mexico, the DF, the Federal District. Good morning. We're talking about, I, this is very bad sound, vet school. The question is, can you apply techniques, TQM and BPR, on a school level, beginning with elementary schools to be able to educate them from the very beginning? Eh, el sonido está muy malo, eh, señores. El sonido está muy malo, por favor. No. Uh, indeed, you, cer you certainly, certainly can be doing that. It's very easy to start. However, you need to ask yourself the question: Is the school itself ready to do that? Um, it would be very easy to come up with a curriculum that one could teach with uh, in terms of kindergarten, first grade, second grade, and third grade. 
My question would be, uh, is that are the teachers prepared? Are the principals prepared? Is the entire school system prepared for those kind of results? And are they willing to change to make those students successful in this new kind of effort? What an exciting challenge. I wonder how many of you out there have children who are only two years old. And I wonder by the time they get into the, I mean, uh, in the second grade, by the time they get in the 10th grade, only eight years from now, it's going to be the year 2003. What kind of educa instructional technology do you suppose we will have available to teach Shakespeare in the, in the year 2003? There are so many interesting things going on with the breakthroughs in computer, with our better understanding of the learning process and so forth. The question is, how are we going to get our institutions within eight years, let's say, to really embrace this new instructional technology, which can really elevate our children considerably. Well, we hope that this video conference, have, that you have enjoyed our, this video conference, we will continue transmitting programs on the latest in management techniques and systems and global competitiveness. We invite you to our next program of the 1994-1995 series, uh, entitled Telecommunications for Education and Professional Development. And this one is this on distance education, alternative models, and implementation, which will be transmitted on February 16. When we also invite you to participate on February 28 in our first video conference of our new series, Strategic Resource Management, entitled International Joint Ventures and Technology as Strategic Resources, Current Free Trade Opportunities, Investment, and Globalization. A certificate or diploma is also available to participants in all, in all four video conferences of this series. For additional information on ITC programs, you may consult your print package where you will find the dates and specific topics of our three series. On behalf of all of us who collaborate with the International Training Center, I thank you for your participation and interest in today's program. Thank you very much and see you soon.